Okay. So we should be live now. Um, it's a 1.54 p.m. Saturday the 24th. And we're a little early just to make sure that everything is functioning properly here. So just getting a little bit arranged right now. Making sure chat is up and working and all my other windows are closed. So let's see here. There we go. So hello everyone. Hello guys. Okay, so let's see. What all do I have to say? Don't really have much. <laughs> the frogs are gay, fan. Do you remember that when we were talking about that? Obama making the, the frogs gay. So, I guess we can go over how to how to kind of do these live shows real fast here. So the way the live show works is, I mean, if you just wanted to to hang out, YouTube is fine. Um, if you wanted to actually purchase the corals, you go to TitleGardens.com, and there's like a live sale link in the top left. It's a blinking red dot. Go to that page. And down below you should see a list of about 250 some odd corals that you can pick through. Um, to actually get the coral, uh, you have to check out with it. So put, just putting it into your shopping cart really doesn't do a whole lot. And by it doesn't do a whole lot, I mean doesn't do anything at all. So somebody else could purchase it if they finish the checkout process. So make sure if you want something to finish the actual checkout. Uh, shipping is a flat rate $39.99 and it's free over $250. We only ship to the U.S. Uh, and not Hawaii. So that's like we ship to Alaska, Puerto Rico, but not Hawaii. Um, if you're going to be placing multiple orders, because like I said, to, to get the individual items you have to check out, uh, go ahead and select live sale. It'll be like local pickup slash live sale. And that's just to prevent you from getting charged shipping over and over and over again. So let's see. Yeah, so hopefully... Um, that but covers it on how these things work. Um, we're going to be going over about 250 some odd corals today, and we should be done a little bit before five o'clock Eastern time. Um, before we get too far, it's just going to be me and uh, Ben today. So he's operating the camera, and I'm operating everything else, including chat, which probably means people are going to get away with entirely too much without getting banned. Also, uh, Patreon. Uh, so thanks very much to, to these guys here, uh, Phil, Mark, Robert, Steve, Ryan, Dave, Nate, Nancy, and Jeff. Um, they are donors on Patreon that have donated over $5 a month, and they get shout-outs during the live shows. So if you wanted to be a contributor, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash titlegardens, and there's some minor perks. I should be revamping those perks. I need to spend a lot more time thinking about Patreon. But I very much appreciate it, guys. Are you, uh, so Donald Musgrave, are you affected by bad weather hitting the south so far? Not really, because, well, first off, we're pretty far north as far as that goes. Um, so we kind of missed all that. But we've been having like a, a one-week heat wave here which has been no fun to deal with because you're you're dealing with like 80 like mid 80s low 90s and for like one or two days it's not bad but for sort of an entire week um some stuff will look rather upset with you okay uh clams uh no clams today clams are a weird thing around here they don't tend to do very well so we tend to not buy them Okay, so without further ado, we can just go ahead and get started. So this first one here is a baby's breath favia, and right away you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of bubbles, and there's going to be a lot of bubbles on pretty much every one of these plugs. Welcome to summertime here in Ohio. So because there's so much, um, I guess, like sunlight and extra sunlight, photosynthesis of all the little microalgaes and cyano and whatnot just goes into overdrive and that's where you pretty much get a lot of this a lot of these bubbles popping up
Got another one here for you guys. So how does the uh, the audio sound? Um, let me know if it's loud enough or if I have to speak up. Um, and hopefully it sounds clearer than it has in the past. Um, I actually had uh, an issue with my software bundle like usual. I updated to like a newer version, but the, how do I say it? Like the icon that I have down in my, in my toolbar was linking to the older version of the software. And since I'm, I now have like the more, uh, the more recent update, I actually have a lot of different little sound modules and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm hoping that um, it, it's really tamped down the background noise. So people are saying it's not in sync. Hmm. Sounds clear, but it's not in sync. Not sure about that. What I can do, um, am I like dropping a lot of frames or something? Here, what I'll do real quick is I'm going to start and, and restart the stream. So. And hopefully that will fix it. We shall see. Just checking this real quick. I'm not going to ask you to keep going. Okay, you need to tell me which, which, which one you're going to. We've been hitting over 100 here in Texas and Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't imagine having a greenhouse down there. That, that just wouldn't work out so well at all. Yeah, so it's strange. So I can see on my on my display here, um, whenever we do drop frames, and I'm not sure why. It only starts dropping frames once I decide to go live. So go figure that. Is the audio still off? Question mark. Hopefully not. Any elegance or fungi is in the sale. I think there are. There's definitely elegances. Yeah, suppose the audio is still not in sync. Uh, let me try one last thing here. I'll try one last thing. Okay. Don't know if that made things better or worse, but we shall see. It says chat and video are way off. Why am I dropping frames? Hmm. Mandrake fern floor, ever keep snake polyps? Yes, I have. There's actually a couple on this live show. Have you ever been poisoned by polytoxin? Not really. Hold on. I'm going to check one other thing here. Uh -huh. So I'm just looking at the output settings here. Hmm. Because sometimes when I'm dropping this many frames, it's usually because there's like 
this ink there's like this inconsistency in what YouTube expects versus what I'm outputting I don't I only want to spend about a minute on each one so you just keep going okay. seems better but not in sync So what we can try to do is start and restart. So hopefully it is fixed, but we'll see. I don't know. I'll keep playing with it one way or another. So that, I mean, I, I'm just like changing the data rates, messing around with that. We'll see. Okay, so people are saying it's better now. Do you know of a small coral safe predator fish? There's a lot of them. Um, depends on what kind of predator you want. Like anglers don't bother coral. They'll bother all your other fish. Marine betas and stuff like that. Everybody's like fixed. I don't know. I still see frames dropping. So we'll see. We'll see if it stays fixed. So I don't know if it's um, my internet speed because okay, so I'm I should be getting um, ten megabits per second upload and um, or close to it. Let's say let's just say you know if I do like a speed test, I'll get like nine, and you should be able to broadcast at like half of that. So I should be able to broadcast at 4.5 megabits per second. I'm broadcasting right now at like 1.5, which is like super low and I'm still dropping frames. So hopefully it figures itself out because that's ridiculous. Okay, what happens if I don't want to check out just yet. I want to see more corals and probably will buy more. Um, you'll want, well, you, you can, you could do that. However, you risk uh, somebody else just buying those corals. So your best bet, if you wanted to make sure that you pick, you got those corals that you, that you liked as we go through, um, you can just check out and then just select local pickup slash live sale. And that way you don't get charged shipping just yet. And then later on, if you see something else you like, just purchase that as you go um, and hopefully R6 Mexico that you're not actually in Mexico because we don't ship to Mexico just an FYI all right okay so yeah let, let me know is the audio still out of sync because I'm seeing like we've dropped seven frames since the second restart so hopefully Hopefully it's all right. Oh, okay. R6 Mexico is actually in Miami. Perfect. That we do ship to Miami. Okay. Fixed, fixed, fixed. Sorry, I haven't really talked too much about these corals just yet. But we've pretty much gone over a lot of um, favias and favites. Uh, they tend to be pretty good growers. The favia tend to be a lot more slow growing than the favites. Favites are very fast growing. Jonathan Andrew Wilson, any elegance corals today? Yes, there are. And audio is okay. Good. Thank you. I'll tell you what, it is, it is always a bit of an adventure. Um, doing one of these live shows because something is always different like we are either I find a new feature or some other thing just decides to behave completely differently like for example I've never used this data rate before um, this is a, like a silly low quality data rate I mean the whole point of uh, me getting a halfway decent 
internet package was to so that I could broadcast in much higher quality, not having to drop down to lower than I've ever done before. So hopefully it's all right. Stop seeing the local McDonald's Wi-Fi. Yeah, really. Maybe I should. Maybe I should like uh, invest in some sort of um, link aggregation thing. Just steal everybody's Wi-Fi so I can broadcast to you guys in higher quality. I'd do it too. So uh, yeah, number 12 here. It's a Pachyceris. These guys are kind of interesting. Um, they, I, th I think they're called like an elephant skin coral or something like that. But they have, um, this one in particular has bright yellow eyes. Okay. Again, lots of little bubbles from all the algae that's just going crazy with the additional sunlight that we get. Yeah, so there's actually one tank that we have that's just full of euphilias. And in the late afternoon, it's pretty much completely covered in bubbles to the point where it's hard to even tell where the, the corals, because, you know, like frog spawn and stuff like that, they look all bubbly, where the coral stops and the bubbles begin. Like, that, that's how... Um, just out of control the just the oxygen production is from the just from like the little microalgae and and whatnot and that's not a, probably not a good thing but it is a thing come summertime here what gives coral their color the animal or their symbiote a little bit of both um, so zooxanthellae is oftentimes kind of a more brownish color, and when corals start expelling zooxanthellae, they tend to, to have like a lighter, more pastel-looking appearance. So a lot of that pastel color, it's more attributed to the, the, the coral animal itself. Um, there's actually something that I read about uh, ultra-low nutrient systems, where this is number 14, correct? Okay, so yeah, about ultra-low nutrient systems where in addition to reducing phosphate and nitrate, which kind of inhibit um, uh, a lot of algae growth, period, um, it'll, they go a step further and include um, like stuff like zinc and uh, a couple other types of chemicals that actually kind of kill off a little bit more zooxanthellae and have it have the corals expel that out so you, you're running like a really fine line on some of those systems to try to get uh, like the ridiculous SPS coloration with ultra low nutrient but going back to your uh, to your question yeah it's a kind of a combination of both the animal and also like the this the zooxanthellae do you ship to Europe no sorry we don't only only the U.S. minus Hawaii and plus Puerto Rico. How long does shipping take? Um, we ship next day air, so that's like FedEx priority overnight. And uh, if we send it out on Monday, it'll be there Tuesday morning in most places. Some places are like... When you uh, select priority overnight, it's not 10.30 a.m. Like the, the earliest shipment is like noon or 2 p.m. or something like that. But it's kind of geography dependent. Most places, it's before 10.30. And in a lot of places, it shows up at like 8.30 a.m. Let's see. Hi, Than. What is your go-to source for new coral info and care tips? I don't even know anymore. Like, to be perfectly honest, I was doing uh, some research on, uh, on a particular topic. I think it was on phosphate removal um, because I, we were doing a, a video on phosphate testing. 
And the first article that came up when I was doing my own research was an article that was written by me, like, years ago. So at this point, I don't even... I, I try to get from anywhere I can. Some of it's anecdotal. Some of it's actually backed up by, by some research. But uh, sometimes it's just kind of like figuring it out for yourself and that's it. Like, for example, uh, if you wanted to do research on potassium, because I, I, we started to, to just do some potassium testing. It's, it's kind of random, but we're doing it for a video. There's like practically nothing about potassium and reef aquariums. So... When it comes time uh, to, to publish that, I'm sure that we're probably going to be the only articles out there on that topic. It's hard to find information about some of these chemistry-related things. Uh, but you were asking about coral specifically. Um, I don't even know, because like, we, we've kept so many corals for so many years. I mean, like I've been doing this for close to 30 years, and there's like very few times where we get a coral that I haven't had for decades previous. So it's kind of hard to say. So for the longest time, uh, these pink sand dollars, we thought that they were Montipora, or I thought they were Montipora, but they always did kind of grow and behave differently than every other Monty I've ever seen. And then so I saw on somebody, somebody else's site that they were selling them as parietes, and that makes a ton more sense. Uh, so yeah, like it turns out that we have a, a few different types of parietes that we're growing here. Ever going to sell bigger than frags? Um, thinking about it, um, my my coral importer was uh, was telling me that I should really get into that. But for the longest time, we really haven't been, I guess, focused on on selling, just bringing in colonies and selling and bringing in colonies and selling them. We've always been more. Um, kind of like sustainability focused and, and a lot more into the frags and things like that. And it's, it's way easier for us to ship, but um, it's, it's something that we're gonna consider in the future. Glycine dosing, nope, have not tried that. Yeah, and it seems like the, the, a big trend now is amino acid supplementation. Not sure. Um, it, it'd be hard for us to test out any product like that because um, the conditions here change so rapidly that just the environment cha would change more than some um, additional thing that we were adding into our system. So, like for example, if, if we tried a, a type of coral food, it's like, well, did the coral food help? Well, I don't know. We were doing this for a long term, and when you're going from like summer to fall to winter that's gonna have like a huge profound effect, way more than any of the coral food would have. So, there you go. And this purple Ganyapora, not cooperating. Maybe the next one will be better. The next one's 21, it's a green Ganyapora. Yeah, they're just not open. So, actually this green Ganyapora, at least he's, it looks like he's been growing. He's got a lot of heads kind of curving down towards the, the base, but not extended today. How are the pink ones? Pretty good, okay. So this is 22. So, okay, little story about these guys here. Um, Will Holland, who I did a, a short video on his tank, he's running uh, Aquaforest. And previously did a bunch of stuff with Z of it and some other uh, ultra low nutrient stuff with like Red Sea and, and whatnot. But he had purchased a frag of this from us probably two, three years ago. And this guy is like no more than an inch, I would say. But just he just pur purchased a frag, grew it to the size of probably a grapefruit, if not larger, maybe like a mango sized piece. He brought it back here cut it in half so now he has two pieces, grew each of those back to a mango sized piece, and then he traded one of those pieces to us. And this is a frag of one of those pieces. And this is another. So these guys here, um, if you could see their base just a little bit, has already started growing all the way down to the plug. So they've done extremely well, considering that Ganyapora traditionally have kind of, I guess, uh, 
not the best reputation for survival and, and certain ones are a lot more tricky than others but this one in this one here i mean i'd, I'd be i would feel confident calling it aquacultured i mean it's been grown in captivity for years now not necessarily here but in in will's tank but even here it's doing pretty well the water changes are helping Are these beginner corals? Mm. Ganipora, I would say no, not really. Um, Fabias and Favites, sure. Duncans, sure. They're not too difficult. They're middle of the road stony corals. So these guys here are Duncans. Again, middle of the road in terms of care. They'll grow additional heads as they get larger and more mature. Derek, what are your thoughts on quarantining everything? I watched a talk by Jason Fox. He talked about how hardcore he's about QT, but he goes on to say he buys like 500 snails a month for a cleanup crew. Um, I think quarantine is probably the most important thing you could you could be doing because there's so many things that survive dips and whatnot. Um, dips cover a lot of bases, but they don't eradicate everything. I mean, we dip stuff like, I don't know, 50, 100 times. Uh, we dip every new thing that comes in and still pests can pop up. I mean, there's just certain things that laugh at the idea of coral dipping. So uh, you either have to um, be really diligent with just your observation or kind of have a tank that is designed to just kill off pests. But even then, it's, it's tough because, if, like for example, Montipora eating nudibranx. Dips don't do anything. And we found some wrasses that actually do a, a really good job of controlling them. And to be perfectly honest, I haven't seen an, a Montipora eating nudibranx in here in months. Probably the last time we saw it was I don't know, January, something like that, like a long, long time ago. And part of the problem is that anytime you bring in a new colony of Montipora, you're at risk of bringing in Montipora eating nudibranx. So we, we have these wrasses, they do a really good job of eradicating to the point that you don't really see them anymore. But that doesn't mean that they're not there. And it only takes like one to start uh, cranking out eggs all by itself. They, I think that they're one of the few animals out there that they can just start laying eggs. They don't need like another nudibranch. And the eggs survive like everything. So we can go from a system that doesn't appear to have anything to having something, like in a hurry, if you don't have that positive predatory pressure on these corals. So yeah, I mean, quarantine is important, but we're getting to the point where, and I think it's every bit as important to have a crew of animals that that deal with all the different problems. Like, if you have a tank large enough, I mean, a copper band, um, a copper band butterfly. Well, make sure you never see an aptasia again. Practically, um, if you have these wrasses, you probably won't have to deal with um, a whole bunch of other issues with nudibranch and with certain uh, kind of pesty type uh, copepods. Because there are some copepods and amphipods that um, can bother coral, so you kind of have to be watchful of that. <clears throat> 29. He buys like 500 snails a month for a cleanup crew. Um, I don't really quarantine snails and stuff. Those just go right in. But I think that the, the, the issue with... So snails are an interesting thing. So the, the least expensive snail that, that really does a great job or astrea snails, and we have tons of them here, but um, they do die at a faster rate than some of the other snails that are more expensive. So I'm wondering if we did like a kind of a cost analysis between them and like trochuses, if it would make more sense to like pay five times the price to get trochuses or not. But in terms of QT, we don't do that with snails. 
best coral dip don't think there is one we use uh we use coral rx and then we dose our tanks with flatworm exit if we see any flatworms aquatic angler can duncan's and candy cane corals be next to each other um to a certain degree they're, they're going to sting each other more from the duncan stinging the candy canes than vice versa but um it might not be lethal I always try to give them a lot of space, if possible. Steven Lewis, I found a nudie bronch in my tank. It's fairly col colorful. Any idea for a site for identification? Unfortunately, I do not. I'm like super racist against nudie bronx. Like I follow all these um, underwater photography um, sites or pages on Facebook. And a lot of them love to take macro pictures of nudibranch, and I'm just not into them at all. Like, I don't care how cool that nudibranch looks, I hate them all now. What camera are you using? This is a Canon C100. And I'm getting an upgrade whenever it decides to, oops. Whenever it decides to show up. I think like the the release date for the C200 is in August. So sometime in August I'll be getting a new camera. What is flatworm exit? I don't know. Sailor for product, I know, and I don't think that they tell what it is. What wrasses would you suggest? I happen to like uh, Melanaris a lot, so that's probably my number one choice. Um, we have a bunch of these uh, yellow ones, so they're either yellow chorus wrasses, like Crisis, or there's like a, a yellow and purple one, um, but I'm not sure if I like those guys as much. They seem to, to either jump out or die more than the Melanarises do. But so far, Melanarises are just fine. Hello, Rossi's Reef Tank. Thanks for joining. Going over some different chalices here. So right now in summertime, one thing that I've noticed is that the eyes of these chalices, when they get overexposed, or and not even so much overexposed, but it is this time of year. Like, hills have eyes chalice. The reason why they're called that is because they actually have green eyes. Um, you can barely tell the green on these on these guys here, and later on you're gonna see uh, what's called a golden eye chalice, and they're supposed to have like yellow eyes. You can barely tell, but um, hey, little guy, little chipmunk ran into the greenhouse. Yeah. So pink Floyd chalices, you might have seen them on, on previous live sales. It's like a mix of pink, purple, and, and green. Yeah, the coloration of these guys is a little weird because because I'm used to seeing a bit more of the green in here. You can kind of see a little bit towards like the, the the middle of its face, but not quite so much. Sydney Williams, what par range would you recommend from micros, micromuso lords? Um. I would go fairly low. I would be between 50 to 100. Do you have free shipping during live sale? Um, the shipping is a flat rate $39.99 and it's free over These are some of my favorite chalices here, the Miami Hurricanes. It's an oldie but goodie. They've been around in the market for a really long time. 
but they've grown really well for us and I, and I really like the colors. I want to get more into some of like the, the really cool rainbow chalices, but I haven't had an opportunity to find one I really like. So this is that golden eye chalice that I mentioned a little bit earlier. You can barely see the little yellow eyes. I wonder if uh, the coloration is as much influenced by the temperature that we're that we're having here as anything else. Because uh, lately, I, I mentioned earlier in the show that we've been hit with like a heat wave of about ten days of like mid eighties, low nineties. That's no fun to have to deal with. And a lot of our tanks were hovering in like the eighty one degree, eighty two degree range, and that's needless to say less than ideal but then the temperature will drop and at night it might like the if you if we don't act, you know have the heaters running because we can only heat or cool we can't do both at the same time so if we happen to have our um, our heater turned off and then the, the, the temperature drops these tanks can go down to like 72 so you're talking about like a 9 or 10 degree temperature difference over the course of like one day and that definitely messes with with certain corals that's one of the perks of just having like a home aquarium versus like a, a big setup in a greenhouse is you have a lot more i guess tight control over uh, temperatures and whatnot uh lori walls can chalice sting each other uh yes if they touch they can kill each other like instantly, pr pretty much. Um, I've seen, you know, some folks they they have chalices and they pretty much grow into each other and they kind of bother one another and it's not that big a deal. I know that in our systems, if we did that, these two these two chalices would eradicate one another. So I wouldn't attempt to put any chalice next to another one. These pastel pink chalices. Speaking of. Um, of chalices that have like some some yellow coloration their eyes will also turn yellow to a lesser degree than the golden eye but um, it'll be like a pink and yellow after uh, so Alex McCann green style in my tank softball size sort of tissue and polyp loss funny you mention that um, some of ours have been acting up in the past week, and I'm, I'm guessing for us it might be heat related, but I'm not sure. Like the last time that we had this uh, this happen, it was um, from like us messing with aquaforest and that going that going poorly. But um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like ours kind of like tightened up a little bit, whereas um, so a whole bunch of them died off during the whole aquaforest thing. And then they came roaring back after we did like a, like a billion water changes. And then it's starting to go kind of like weirdly downhill in one of our tanks. And I can't think of what, what happened. <clears throat> yeah, best to dip, uh, or best dip to use, and should I just frag off? You might, just wanted to, to, to propagate it see if that'll help. That's kind of like a last ditch resort. I don't know if there's a dip that's going to save uh, a coral that's losing flesh like that. Getting into some different Montes now. I'm just glad that we don't have nearly the pest issues that I've seen in the past. Um, like when you have like a home aquarium and you get uh, like a, a pest, it's one thing to lose one coral. It's like it's it's awful and you feel bad. But if something were like that were to happen here, um, you're talking about like trays where each tray holds like 25 corals, 
and there's like five trays of this stuff and if if it's a bad pest none of it's going to survive so yeah we take pests really seriously here David Laws, please answer my question. Why can I get other corals to thrive, but I can't get zoas to thrive? Tough to say. I mean, you might have to test all your water. Might have to see if there's something eating them. There's a good chance that there might be something eating them. There's a lot of things that eat multiple, that, that eat uh, zoanthids. Nudibranch, spiders, certain copepods snails, crabs, fish, any number of things could be killing zoas. So people always ask, are zoas easy to keep? And yeah, if, if there's nothing, a fire truck, um, if there's nothing directly bothering the coral, it should grow just fine. But if, but there's like so many things or just disease, just good old fashioned disease could be a problem. So there's like a million cop cars or something like that rolling past my place. That's the, the joys of living on a state route, I guess. So are we moving into 45? So you think this is loud, like during the weekend, and, and luckily we've avoided it today, but there's like an air raid siren that they test like every weekend. It's like a straight up air raid siren. Okay, so number 45 here is a Superman Montipora. We're actually getting decent coloration in our Montiporas, which I would normally say, big deal, who cares? Except for the fact that we're in late June and still getting good coloration. The summertime can be very, very harsh on our corals. So still getting it done. Miguel, did you pay your taxes? Yeah, you're gonna send a fire truck after my taxes. <laughs> So did um so there's this thing called swatting that like uh people do to like usually gamer channels, but they'll call in some like a bomb threat or something like that to somebody that's live streaming and then like the like the SWAT team has to like show up and do some crazy stuff and like the kids think it's some kind of joke. But I'm sure somebody eventually is gonna get killed doing that. That or I think that the person calling it in might be like guilty of a felony. <laughs> There's also that, but I don't know. Nope, I was not swatted. It was just some fire, presumably. So I don't know if you can see this in number 47 here, but right in the middle, there's this little tiny black mark. That's a bivalve of some, point, of some sort. It's like, um, it looks like a little blue clam but they stay small like that. Or that one might be a barnacle, but I've seen some that are actually, they look like little blue clams. So Tater Todd is asking, uh, his tank has some weird film on the top of the water. Um, usually that's from lack of surface skimming. Uh, like an overflow box or something like that would help a lot. That's one of the, the, the nicest things about having a sump and an overflow is that it the overflow itself removes all any kind of like surface scum and that also helps increase gas exchange in your tank.
So I've mentioned it in the in the past live show and, and to some degree during this live show, but we've revamped our water change schedule. So we're basically doing water changes almost every day now. And I think it's the, the corals that have benefited most are a lot of these SPS. For the longest time, we weren't able to keep acros or montes or anything like that during the, during the summertime months because um, they would, for whatever reason, just kind of get discolored or just not grow well at all. But lately, we've gotten a lot better at it. Um, obviously, I think a lot of it has to do with more consistent lighting, but just water chemistry. I'm, I shouldn't be surprised, but I guess I'm surprised at just how much you can just how much of a benefit it is to have rock like just rock solid water chemistry and the fact that like we've been going to such an aggressive water change schedule um so it's it's aggressive for us but it's it's essentially 15 gallons a week or 15 sorry 15 gallons it's 15 percent a week per system so uh, that comes out to a little over 150 gallons per day that we're, we're changing. And yeah, it, it's really helped out quite a lot. I mean, we still get like algae because there's, there's just so much, um, so much light in the, in the summertime to deal with. But it's not really that noticeable, um, except for like the bubbles. You notice the bubbles. But uh, the corals themselves have, have looked the best they've ever looked. And these guys here, these uh, Sephastria, were looking so bad uh, not that long ago. And they've all bounced back and have started to just to explode in growth. And their colors are great. I mean, this is, this is as good as the colors really get for these guys. And it, it's all just water chemistry because we didn't do much in the way of lighting. They're, they're very low light corals. So uh, Anthony, how are those T5s you showed a few months back working out, the super cheap fixtures? Were these corals grown under that light? Yes. Um, we have a bunch of these fixtures and we're getting to that point where like this fall I'm going to have to swap out all the bulbs. I'm not looking forward to that because like we just did a, a quick bulb count. It's well, it's, it's closer to, it's close to like 200 bulbs that I'm going to have to replace. So it's, it's a bunch. Um, not looking forward to paying that bill, but I'm sure that it's worth it just in terms of the coral coloration of the coral growth. So having said that, like we are, so we've been moving away from a lot of LED lights, but we still have some tanks with LED that are growing just great. Um, so if you needed to save electricity or if you needed to conserve heat better or if you really wanted that extra little bit of control there's really nothing wrong with uh, going with LED for that there's just some other drawbacks that I wasn't crazy about especially with how uh, gummed up the fans would get here in a greenhouse so those units are, are more prone to failure here than they would be in like a home aquarium so for a home aquarium if you wanted to get like um, I don't know, let's say like a Radeon G4s or something like that. That's going to be great. They're going to last a lot longer for you there than they would out here for us. So it's something that we might revisit way later. But um, as far as like the cost of fixtures, you really can't beat like 100 bucks plus bulbs. So there's that. And these, these fixtures, A, if they happen to fail, I just replace them. And so far, none of them have failed. But B, it's like there's no fans or anything to gum up. So there's going to be no like uh, heat issues that, that need to be managed in that way, I guess. 56. These are some Pavonas. Cajun Reefer, where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from Burma. And here, it's Ohio. Uh, Alex McCann, what salt are you guys using? We're using Omega C. And what would you recommend for a mixed reef SPS LPS? When it comes to salt, 
Um, I don't know if I really like one brand in particular over another. What I would suggest is that it's more important that you cycle through it more so than what brand of salt you end up going with. If you want Red Sea Coral Pro, great. Use more of it. If you want to use Omega C, great. If you want to use Instant Ocean or Reef Crystals, great. If you want to go to Aqua Forest, great. But just like not just stick with the one because switching salts can get weird. But um, just not doing enough of it can also be an issue. So if you if you keep up with like the regular water changes, it practically doesn't matter what salt you use. Because I'm going to be willing to bet that not too many people out there use the salt that I use. And the, the, my reasoning for using the salt has nothing to do with like, oh, it, it's so good for my corals. It's all about just convenience and price for me. And I just use it a lot. And so that's, that's why I'm getting the results I'm getting. So, yeah, when it comes to salt, I'm not like super evangelical about it. And our customers, um, they use every different type of salt out there. Like you, you name it. I have customers that use it, and it's fine. And I'm not trying to switch them off uh, from that to anything else. So Anthony is saying, I bought two fixtures myself, and they're really nice, but so far I haven't tried growing corals with them. Um, it's just the bulbs. I mean, you're just driving bulbs so if you if you have some bulbs that you like so like we use uh, ATI bulbs here um, and I really like the blue plus and coral plus combination and they've been doing really well for us the seemingly the um, the the fixture that I like the most so far is a six bulb fixture and um, yeah having just like an equal mix of coral plus and blue plus has done really really nicely with just what every other kind of just about every kind of coral especially like the uh, SPS what are you, what are you messing with? oh uh, flashlight ran out of batteries which by the way I'm surprised I haven't mentioned it up to this point but um when we you might notice like a little bit of a color change it's where we have like this led flashlight that just to show some fluorescence uh because these again these are fluorescent and the fluorescents aren't they i mean they're not like daylight they're definitely blue but you're not going to see like that you know that crazy amount of fluorescence especially in a greenhouse in the early afternoon can i ask what your water parameters are I don't have them in front of me, but they're they're pretty standard. I mean, we were having some low alkalinity for a little while. Um, the the low alkalinity was at the lowest is right around like five, and now we're kind of hovering towards like seven to eight. Um, but it, everything else is just kind of like natural salt water, like four fifty ish for calcium. Or potassium is in check because we just tested it. Yeah, nothing too much to to report there. Just if you're if you're just trying to shoot for anything, just shoot for natural salt water levels of everything. You're fine. Do you have cooling or or air conditioning in the greenhouse? No tater tot. Well, we have cooling, but it's not air conditioning. To do air conditioning in something like this, it would take like a ginormous system. So we we rely mainly on like a big exhaust fan. We have some geothermal cooling that cools the water directly. In the really hot days, um, we take the RO water. That's or the, you know, so when you make RO water, you get like wastewater and cl the clean water. So what we decide to do is take that wastewater line and we put it into like this little manifold. And this manifold uh, just sends water to like strategically, <laughs> you know, placed. Um, areas of the greenhouse where we essentially flood the entire floor of the greenhouse for evaporative cooling So it's like a big swamp in here My off is around 12.5 dkh. Is that too high? It's really high, but I don't know if it's too high um, But yeah, that's really high. I mean I, I, when you're getting into dkh that high 
And I would worry about how that's affecting calcium and magnesium levels. Because, I mean, 12, I think natural salt water is closer to like 7 or 8, like 7.5 to 8.5. Sorry, what was that, Ben? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I just noticed that. So, if you are interested in these, there's 10 of these available. What are your thoughts on bubble scrubbing? I haven't really tried it. Some people like it, but I, like I said, I haven't tried it. I'd be worried that of my corals swallowing bubbles. That's never a good thing. Speaking of coral swallowing bubbles, this uh, neon green cabbage has bubbles growing on it just from the microbes that are photosynthetic. It looks like all of these guys are just like closed up because and uh, I guess they're they're they've got tan polyps. These guys when when they finally do extend. So if you don't know, like sarcophytans are or, or not, this isn't a sarcophyton. I'm sorry, this is a green cabbage. But like all of these different types of leathers, they develop like a wax coat to kind of uh, to protect themselves from like microalgae and things like that. And they, so this is 63, it's a pink cabbage. They'll eventually shed off that coat and then fully extend again. So these guys look like they're kind of retracted in and kind of sloughing off that, that wax coat. Okay, so do you offer local pickup? I do. Uh, everything has to be by appointment, though. Um, we don't have, like, regular hours or anything like that, walk-in hours. 65. Devil's Hand Leather. Dan, what is your ideal woman? A fellow reefer? I don't think I'm dateable. I'll let you read into that however you like, but I don't think I'm relationship quality right now. 66. Another devil's hand. So you can kind of see like once they do slough off that, that sheen, you can see the polyp extension. Coral pro salt has very high DKH. Some things do. Um, when it comes to, you almost want a salt to have too low of something rather than too high. Because if it's too low in something, you can always add that as a supplement, right? So if it's low in calcium, no big deal. Just get some calcium chloride or something. You can bump it up. Calquas, you can bump it up, whatever. But if it's too high to begin with, then what do you do exactly? Because you just can't do more water changes. And then now you have to like try to add something else to knock that value down. That's going to be that's going to be a little bit of a hurdle. So if anything, if I was a salt manufacturer, well, what do I know about salt chemistry? But if if uh, if I was shopping for salt, it's almost better, like I said, to have everything kind of aim a little bit low. Like if you're going to miss, miss low. This guy here looks like he's gonna peek out. So these green toadstools, green base tan polyps. And these are sarcophytons, so they kind of get that, that full mushroom shape. Do you keep your tanks with high nutrients? Yeah, I'd say so. I think there are nitrates and phosphates um, on paper are higher than we would like. Uh, phosphates, I don't remember what the values were the last time we tested, but they're probably like five to 10, which is a lot better than 80, which is the last time we were talking about it. 
So somebody was talking about these uh, snake polyps, so we call them, call them the snack corals. So, so these are Isarius. Uh, they are usually weird little hitchhikers. They're nocturnal, and so they have like a a single uh, a single polyp right at the tip there, which looks kind of like a a sun coral or like slash like a cross between a sun coral and a paleothoa, if you can imagine that. And uh, they pretty much only come out at night. Very rarely have I seen them come out during the day. Okay. Number 70 is a green snack coral. Uh, this thing kind of has like some weird little uh, fluorescent green highlights you can see there. I don't know what the color of the polyp is because these guys haven't opened up for me. Uh, Chris May, is there shipping to Canada? Unfortunately, no, we don't ship to Canada. It's, it's US only minus Hawaii. Okay, 71 is a little yellow, uh, little rainbow Yuma here, Recordia Yuma. Um, these guys can be challenging. So if you have kept Yuma successfully before, uh, you might want to take a look at this guy. Like the coloration is like really, really cool but um, they can be really sensitive. Most mushrooms, I would say, are not that difficult to keep. But for, for some reason, very, very nicely colored uh, Recordia Yuma tend to be. They're like a, they're a Pacific Recordia. Having said that, there's not very much in the way of Atlantic Recordia right now because most of them in the wild are dead in Florida. And then most of the ones in Puerto Rico, they are of questionable legality as to whether they're allowed to be shipped to the U.S. They are being shipped to the U.S. I just don't know if it's being done legally anymore. Not, like I said, I don't know. I'm not an importer in that way. But yeah, it's, it's been harder to purchase Florida Recordia, Recordia Florida. <clears throat> Got some Leptoceras here. Yeah, sorry, Chris. I know a lot of folks are, are asking about Canada, and there's there's different uh, things involved with shipping corals to Canada. Um, you know, partly, I believe you still have to have everything under CITES, which means that you guys still need to have like import licenses and stuff. And but I think you know there there's only certain corals that you have to to claim. But that doesn't mean that your coral can't get stopped in customs for days. I mean, it's it's a mess. So it's just not a risk that we were ever looking to take. Uh, the image is just a little bit shady, Ben. Can I keep my freshwater mono angelfish in a saltwater tank? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. What is the best way to get rid of bristle worms? Um, you could get a fish that eats bristle worms. I, I happen to like bristle worms, so I, I don't go out of my way to get rid of them. This Yumacore looks stressed. Yeah, it might be. That was a fairly new acquisition. There's very few Recordia Yuma that we've kept that have done like amazingly well. There's one like giant one, which it's not like the a typical one. It's I mean the, it's like the size of a small pizza, and so it's the only one that we've had that's like that. And that one's done really well. But like the the really colorful ones, like the like a bright red Yuma, they tend to not do well for us. There's one of our tanks here that if you pick up the wrong rock, it is like a bowl of spaghetti underneath. So for all you uh, bristle worm haters, yeah. So 75 is a jack-o'-lantern Leptoceras. These are some very fast growing corals. I mean, there was a time where like a jack-o'-lantern Leptoceras was like hundreds of dollars. And because they're so, uh, so fast growing that the price on them is just dropping. Yeah, a lot of fish eat bristle worms. Um, like, going back to my butterfly thing, I, th I think that copper band butterflies would much rather be eating things like bristle worms and stuff like that rather than Aptasia. Um, like, I know ours likes to eat all kinds of worms, all kinds of. Um, yep. 
uh, all kinds of the next coral, by the way, is going to be a bubblegum chalice. There we go. Um, I'm trying to think of what other fish really like to, to, to go after worms. Like certain wrasses, I could see uh, doing that. But usually the you know the wrasses are only going to try to eat worms that are like very small. Um, so they're going to eat like the baby worms. Because I mean, we, we've got worms that are probably like five, six inches. So it's a small wrasse is going to handle that. So yeah, starfish, um, that's another thing that could possibly be eating uh, zoanthids. Yeah, but there, there's a, there's a Asterina starfish, and they can eat all kinds of corals. Like right now we have a Pocillopora like growing just out of our ears, and we found like these big um, starfish eating them. And half the time I don't even bother removing them. I was like, I don't really care because we have so many Pocillopora. But yeah, they, they, those things can get fairly large, like the size of a 50 cent piece, and start eating all kinds of stuff. It'll be interesting to see if um, a lot of these chalices are going to develop additional colors. Because I remember when we've got these, I think that they they've had at least two colors going on. Seventy-eight. So this is a blue-eyed lithophyllin. So I think it's this particular tank. Because I'm looking at the lights in this tank. And this is one of the tanks that... Uh, is a little bit differently lit. It, this has a purple plus light, I believe, so things tend to look a little bit more muted and darker. Uh, these guys usually have brighter sky blue eyes. Looks like a lot of coral when it comes to like their like the eye color has changed because of the season. Okay, 79. We're finally into some Micromusa Lords. Uh, I would love to be in a position where we could grow these things like crazy. Right now, um, they do okay, but in everybody else's tank, they do so well. Like, I was over at my personal trainer's place, and uh, he had purchased a couple of um, Micromusa Lords from us, and like the heads of them are like that big. They're bigger than a 50 cent piece each and just so like fleshy. And I'm like, how, how is this even possible? Like none of our corals get that fleshy. Um, and he had uh, another colony at his office that was just like near death. He was thinking about throwing it away. That's how bad this thing looked. And now, um, again, every single polyp is the size of a 50 cent piece. And all this guy does is just do water changes. Because this, this is what I, I recommended to him. And since he started doing that, his corals just went crazy. And we, we were thinking, like, is, is it the lighting? And <laughs> going back to why, you know, my aversion to LEDs isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, or I should say, LEDs aren't necessarily a bad thing despite my aversion to them. Uh, he is using the lights that we sold to get to to make room for our T5s. So it's not like, oh, you know, he he's got some some hidden secret lighting. No, he has our lighting. <laughs> it's just for whatever reason, um, whatever he's doing is working incredibly well. And like, yeah, to to be to be fair, like these things look great right now, but I've I've never seen just how big and fleshy those things were. So usually like an Acan Bower Banky will have very, very large polyps compared to like a Micromusa Lord. But his Micromusa Lords had bigger polyps than any Bower Banky that we've ever kept. <clears throat> 82. Rossi's Reef Tank. Bye. That bubblegum chalice looks just like Fleer's double bubble chewing gum. I remember that stuff.
you can you can really see the the fluorescence pop out when it comes to uh, these guys. So you know they used to be called Acan Lords, now they're Micromusas, I guess. There's there's some uh, some changing of names going on more regularly than before because I think as like researchers start to do like genetic testing and stuff like that, they kind of reclassify things. Not that that changes what we do much. We just you know, change our website or something. So when it comes to like lighting these, like I, I was gonna recommend you know somewhat lower light T5. Obviously, it's not necessary. You can get very good growth and coloration with uh, with LED. I have a Cyanarina, so this is Robert asking, that I've had for a few years now. Do you think a Scolemio would also do well? It should. I mean, the two are pretty similar when it comes to uh, to care. Like, I wouldn't necessarily do something different from one than the other. Uh, similar light, similar flow. I don't think they're going to fight too much if they happen to touch. I haven't really tested that, though. The only thing about scolies um, is that sometimes their skeleton being a little bit more pokey can poke through their skin during like transit and sometimes uh, they don't recover quite as well for, for some reason. Cyanarinas some tend to tend to ship better. Not that it's usually not a big deal, but it could happen. We got a really nice acanthophilia in and Going from where we picked it up to bring it here was only about an hour, and in that hour, it got super stressed and like the skeleton's poking through. I'm like, ugh, and it hasn't recovered quite yet. So hopefully it does, because if you know anything about like acanthophilia, it's ridiculously expensive for for everybody involved. So don't want to lose that one. Eighty seven. Okay. I'll be right back. I'm gonna grab my drink. And no, it's not alcoholic, it's just water. <clears throat> so these are some cloves. So um, clove polyps, their tips are going to be orange. And that's a tough thing to see in this without like the, the flashlight. But... Yeah, hopefully we'll get the fluorescence coming out. So if you were to see this guy in like complete, you can see a little bit there, little tiny bit, but under like like all blue um, actinics, that's when it really gets very punchy. <clears throat> Did you dip the acanthophilia in iodine? Uh, I don't know. I think I went to Coral RX first, but out of the bag, it was it was like spiky. So this is the green tip clove. So real quick, is my audio still off, or has it been pretty much uh, in sync this whole time? Because I'm looking at our, my total uh, dropped frame rate. And we are at 77 dropped. So I've restarted the stream like I think three times now. And we're running at really low um, low data rate. But still, there's been 77 uh, frames dropped. <clears throat> These are pipe organs. Kind of look similar. They have a very different base. If you're familiar with pipe organs at all, they kind of have like this red hard base. Okay, good. Thanks, Ernie. I always worry about like some technical issues. I've got like 10 different things plugged in to make this show happen. And like any number of these wires could go wrong. The software could go wrong. So hopefully it's still working. Got a tang question. 90 long. Do you think I could do three tangs? You could. Probably wouldn't be the best idea though. I mean, if 
Fewer tangs are going to work out better than more tangs. Audio is good. Should talk more about camera gear. What do you want to know? I could talk about cameras forever. Like, I could talk about cameras more than anybody wants to hear about cameras. I'm actually going to be getting a new camera. So currently we're using a, a Canon C100. It's the kind of like Canon's entry level uh, cinema series. So that's like the, that's what, it's like a C something. So it'll be, so currently they've, get, they've got like a C100, they've got a C300, and a C700, C500, but that's like four years old and nobody really bought that camera. It got, kind of got replaced by, um, the C700, which by the way, a C700 is like 25 grand or something. It's like a really expensive um, you know, production cinema camera. So this guy is like the very entry level. I'm going to be getting a new one though because they came with the C200 that um, is oddly possibly better than the C300 in many ways. But I'm really looking forward to the C200. Um, I've already pre-ordered it. It's going to come out in August. And I might actually be doing 4K videos, maybe. That's the other problem. You get a better camera, and suddenly your your uh, disk space, you start to have issues. Like, to put it into perspective, this camera currently records at a maximum of 25 megabits per second. Um, when you're shooting at 4K RAW on the C200, I think the data rate is 1,000. So 1,000 versus 25. So you're using up way more space for a much bigger file. Done any more shooting with that Canon Super Macro? Um, a little bit here and there. I would say that 99% of the time we use a 100 millimeter macro, which is what you're currently seeing. Um, and the other one's like a more of a specialty lens and it's very difficult to use in comparison. And it has a different um, color to it. It's a lot, um, less saturated so that you i mean that sounds weird right that a lens would have any bearing on things like saturation there's no question like how different lenses render color so this particular lens that you're seeing does the best that i've ever seen when it comes to uh, just bringing up rich color and if for whatever reason like other lenses it's not, it's just, it's just not the same. <clears throat> Can you give an example of what might come in one of your feel lucky Zoanthid 10 packs? Um, honestly, I'd be the worst person to ask about that. Partly because, um, I've forgotten 60% of all the zoanthid names like I just mentally checked out from that space altogether so I promise that you will not get duplicates and I promise that they will all look nice but you can expect uh, a retail value around I don't know what did, what did we say like 250 or more and I think that the price tag on the package is like 125 You'll definitely get a like you'll definitely be rewarded for purchasing a sight unseen quantity of ten. Let's just say. So you won't you're not gonna be receiving complete and utter garbage. I mean I guess I guess one man's trash is another man's treasure sort of thing. I mean some people really like really really um colorless things. Like I mean, and we're not just talking about just people with bad taste. Like some people have like really good taste, but they also happen to like this this one particular coral that has no color. So who knows? Who knows? I mean, we're gonna try to send stuff that we like, I guess. Um, mostly stuff that we've been we've, we've been doing so so much propagation lately. It's more than anything to uh, to thin out volume more than it is to like get rid of just trash, you know, like I'm not going to name names, but there, there's like some junky corals out there and we try not to have them to begin with. We try not to. 
<clears throat> Actually, better yet, why doesn't somebody buy one of these these packs and do like an unboxing and show everybody else what you got? That might be even more interesting. So it's not not just me uh, making it up on the spot like I just did. All right, let's see. <clears throat> 98. Well, by the way, we're going to be doing some some other packs like that. So if if people are interested in just like just filling out their tank with some really inexpensive stuff, um, that's a route that they can go. Like we might do like certain SPS sampler packs, things like that. Like a beginner SPS sample pack, um, and then all acro pack, and all Monty pack, and all Leptoceras pack, and all Pavides, Parides, Pavides. I was thinking Pavona and Parides at the same time. So this guy's 99, correct? I have mostly an SPS dominated 57 with Euphilia at the bottom. What are the care requirements for pipe organ in terms of light and flow? Don't think they care so much about light. Um, I would go a little extra on the flow. You want to make sure that nothing builds up, like no detritus or anything like that builds up in its uh, in that skeleton. We've got this kind of red intricate skeleton. <clears throat> I have an SPS tank uh, that is follow at the time. What do you suggest to get rid of tiny spots of bryopsis without hurting my corals or messing up my parameters? Uh, that's a toughie. Um, if you can remove most of it by hand, that'd be great. Uh, fox face would be the best bet as far as fish goes, but a lot of fish don't like bryopsis. Um, then there's always uh, Kent Tech M, which is a magnesium supplement, which has, I guess, some sort of impurity in it that, uh, that eradicates bryopsis. But if it were my tank, um, I would try to remove as much of it as humanly possible and get a fox face. Does the jack-o'-lantern leptosera sting? Uh, not any more or less than any other coral, I guess. Um, they're not known to be aggressive. They don't like send out sweepers or anything. Am I the only one who thinks that candy canes look like acanthophilia? Um, yeah, you might be. I mean, acanthophilia are big. They're like that big. I mean, like an acanthophilia is bigger than the biggest goalie. Okay, speaking of Zoas, right? We're talking about that Zoa 10 pack. I don't know, you might see something like this. I, I, it'd be easier to like to point out corals that you're probably not going to see in a Zoa pack. And you're, you're probably going to tell because there might be like a hundred bucks or something. It's like, yeah, that one is probably not going to be in the, in the Zoa pack. <clears throat> One oh four. Very dark. Yeah, it's a mix of what looks like Leonardo Leonardo's and something else that has a little more of a, of a blue face. You might see something like that. In these next uh, upcoming shows, uh, we're probably going to be having guests. So this one, we're all alone. So in the, in the last live show, um, we had my friend Nathan come. Um, and so that was a lot of fun, you know, having just another person to, to bounce ideas off of and whatnot. And you guys can get some insight on how he keeps his tank. So there's a couple of other folks that I was thinking about having come by. 
So one person was Will, so I did uh, a video on his tank and I might do um, an update down the road here. Cause like his tank when, uh, so I've, I've done like two short videos. One was just him getting his tank and putting it into place. Kind of like a rough uh, walkthrough of some of the equipment and stuff like that. Second one was actually with it running with a little bit of um, just like smaller colonies and he said that since since then like those colonies have absolutely taken off and a lot of the uh, algae has been eradicated just from the you know when you, when you start up a tank you get like nuisance algae so that is more or less gone um, don't know if he's got any new fish or anything like that but it'd be good to, to kind of follow up on that tank but uh, we're talking about him coming in for the August live show I believe I'll have to check the, the, the calendar for that. And then after that, um, I have a, a friend and slash uh, business partner for some unrelated thing. And he used to be uh, active in the hobby, but he's really active in tech. So if you guys are interested in like, you know, consumer electronics type stuff, he has a channel that um, we can talk about at the time there and just, you know, just talk about random stuff. We don't always have to talk about, you know, corals necessarily as as you know, we're, we're seeing these different types of zoas, but have him on. He's a, he's a real cool guy. Um, and I'm thinking about having, like doing a, a video on my on personal trainer's tank and we can kind of like go, like do a walkthrough of that. Plus if you have any kind of like exercise and fitness questions, you can ask him or, or diet and, and nutrition as well. So. So just um just mixing it up, just have some other people so you're just not always just looking at me on these shows. <clears throat> Alright. Oops, 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 oops. Clicked on the wrong thing there. Okay, so Than, I have a Monty Cap that's doing very well. What is a good next option of SPS to add? You can really go with a lot of things. I mean, if you're keeping Montipora well, you should be able to keep Bird's Nest, Oslopora, Stylophora just fine, Pavona just fine. You might even try some certain acros, I'm sure. They'll do, well, acros would be like the most challenging just because they're so oddly finicky when it comes to that sort of thing. But, I mean, if you're, if you're already having some success with it, no reason why it shouldn't continue. Paul Disner. Hello, fan. Thanks for all the education and great video photography. You're great. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. Entities Aquariums. Hey, Than. I lost a couple of mushrooms because they didn't attach. And I'm getting red bumps over one of the rocks, and some of them already look like just some... Uh... Do you think they multiplied? Uh... It's possible. Um, so not attaching is like the worst thing that can happen to a mushroom. That's opinion, opinion me. But it's the hardest thing to get them to do. And once they become detached, it's the hardest thing for them to recover from. They just kind of end up rolling around and just dying. So I always kind of just keep an eye on that, make sure that they're not getting too much flow to, to the point where they detach. And if they do detach, you kind of have to have like a little separate, practically a separate tank for them to reattach to a new substrate. And then you can take that little bit of substrate and then glue it down to something bigger. Okay. So Makazo was M A C A W not two C's. Um, these probably will not be in the 10 pack, but they're very nice. One of my favorites as far as like Zoas go. <clears throat> uh, Cleve Torres, heard about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I wonder if if anybody's used ChemiClean to take care of Bryopsis or not. 
Well, speaking of Chemiclean, uh, so Chemiclean is that uh, it's supposed to remove red slime algae and claims that it is not an antibiotic. Somebody from Germany, I believe, said that it did test positive for a specific type of antibiotic. And then uh, other people think it's potassium permanganate, which is like used in freshwater ponds a lot to eradicate algae. So, or specifically cyanobacteria. Because I think that if you use like an antibiotic, theoretically that should like mess up your whole bacteria cycle, like your nitrogen cycling. And chemically definitely doesn't. And it doesn't mess with the probiotic stuff because uh, this particular person, he was using um, Chemiclean in, um, in an aquaforest tank. So, like, theoretically, that should just kill a bunch of the different types of, uh, of bacteria that, that's keeping that system running, and it didn't. So, yeah, I really wonder. Can, and if you, if you look up potassium permanganate and its use in, like, ponds and, and how it... Um, how you need to keep uh, everything aerated, it sounds remarkably close to Chemiclean. So yeah, I'm curious if, uh, A, if any of you guys have heard of that. Um, again, I don't really know for sure. And B, uh, if that would be something that would work for Bryopsis. Something to think about. I'm not gonna toot my own horn here, but we don't really have a lot of Bryopsis. So it's hard for us to like say, oh, we did this and that took care of it. Chances are it's probably just like a, a fish nibbled the little bit of Bryopsis that we had and it's pretty much gone. So uh, I forget exactly what it was about potassium permanganate that um, makes this ma makes it so you have to like extra aerate the tank. Um, I think in a pond it's because you've killed off all the algae and that creates like a low oxygen environment. But I don't know what what that would be in like the home aquarium. <clears throat> Are these toxic revenge really? 117? Interesting. I always thought these were more orange. Could just be weird summertime coloration. Random question for the for the chat. Has everybody seen Wonder Woman yet? That's like the best DC movie I've seen since Dark Knight. I have indeed seen it. Very good. So you, what's crazy, okay, is that the director of, of Wonder Woman is Patty Jenkins, okay? She hasn't directed a movie in like 13 years. So a long time ago, she directed this movie called Monster, which is about a serial killer um, uh, who was played by Charlize Theron. So like as gorgeous as I think like Charlize was, she looked rough in that movie. They made her look 
completely different. And she won Best Actress for that particular video. Or video, that movie. And you would think that like, oh great, um, that means uh, you might be asked to do another movie. 13 years. It takes 13 years and she does Wonder Woman. And I'm just thinking, what the heck is wrong with like the industry that somebody that talented at directing doesn't get another movie for 13 years after having like an Academy Award for, for Best Actress. That's, it, it boggles my mind. I feel like I've been cheated out of like a lot of really good movies that could have been. What's the difference between gobstoppers and everlasting gobstoppers? I have no idea. That sounds like a. That sounds like a a question for Doctor Google, and Google image search. Let's see what shows up. What's the maximum level of nitrate for keeping soft corals? I don't want to get any if they will turn brown. Should I wait till my nitrates go down? Um, yeah, I think that if you're, if you're having like nitrates over like 20 or 30, it's not a great thing. I mean, you'll really want to get those down closer to five. So if you have like, I don't know what your nitrate levels are but if they're above 20, I mean, are, are the corals gonna struggle that bad with nitrates over 20? Maybe not, but generally speaking, if you're gonna be chasing, uh, chasing numbers, five is a good number. Olga Levitsky, welcome to the show. Can I add 30 pounds of dry rocks to my existing 30 pounds of live rock in an established tank? Does it need to be cured? Um, not really. Um, even if even if it's dry, a lot of times it'll still leach a little bit of something. You might get like a, some nuisance algae. But in terms of like curing, it's usually so. If there's some like harmful chemical for some reason in, in the processing of it, that's one thing. But when you're talking about curing live rock, you're really looking to like kill off some, or I guess letting whatever that's that's died um, like break down and stop polluting the water. So that typically doesn't happen with. Uh, with dry rock unless there's like a dead chipmunk in there or something like that One twenty-five. Recently cycled my tank and nitrates are around 50 still Yeah, you, and again, you can just dilute that down with water changes Darren Hockey, my nitrates are 80, and I can't get any lower. I have 20 soft corals growing. Water changes, people. <laughs> no, it's, when it, when it comes to nitrates, I mean, nitrates and phosphates. Like, sometimes uh, you'll do water changes, and you'll be disappointed initially with the results. And it's like, what's going on? Like, I should be having lower figures than this already. It takes kind of like a compounding of that of that activity for to really take hold uh, kind of like turning it's like turning like a big um, like tanker truck it just takes time are there any rastas that's a good question I don't think so I just just told no don't know why but there's none usually there are I found a dead octopus in my dry pukani but no chipmunk
So as much as I harp on doing water changes, there's uh, other folks that do methodologies that involve like no water changes. Uh, I know like Triton is like that, I believe. The place that does like the, the chemistry testing, they're all about like, no, just leave the water just as is and just supplement with this, that, and the other thing. And it's, it's weird how different things can work for different people. It's like you're, this. This hobby is is so much of your mileage may vary. It's not even funny. So like, I, I would never consider doing a no water change system, but you know, clearly it works for some folks. Looks like it's gonna rain here. One thirty, not cooperating at all. Let's move on. Oh god, look like he has a little beard of algae. Summertime. <clears throat> DJ Loins, how often do you do these live sales? We shoot for once a month for like these live shows. I think any more than that, and they might not be special. I don't know. That and it's uh, it is kind of time consuming to 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 put it all together. And I think my throat would just be dead from having to to talk for three hours straight all the time. Like, I don't know how radio guys do it. They do like three hour shows every day. I can't talk that long. <clears throat> I did a 50% water change yesterday. Is today too soon? I want to get those nitrates to go down. Um, 50% yesterday and to do another one today. It might be, honestly, but um, another thing that, that people sometimes have success with is just to do like more modest water changes, but over the course of the week. So like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, do like 20 gallons. And so you're ending up changing more water, but, but I guess like the frequency of it allows um, for some weird diffusion. Like there, there's some papers on that you can take a look at. I don't have any links with me though. <clears throat> I've been arguing mechanics of water changes on a thread in RC and it started getting blown up so I felt it was best to stop due to exactly your miles is very on how it work. Yeah, I mean like so I've mentioned it a couple times, right? Like Aquaforest, we 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 tried it and like a good third of our corals died in a week. And but that doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. Like Will is is currently using Aquaforest and he's has plenty of success with it right and he's has plenty of success with it with our coral and he'll just take stuff direct from our systems acclimate it for like five minutes and into his tank it's fine we do aqua forest not fine so yeah your miles will definitely vary and so i always suggest if you're going to listen to anybody look at their tanks first Th their tank is going to tell you a lot about about I guess their aptitude to build it and also methodology that might work now if you try to copy it verbatim it might it might work but then again if it doesn't then try something else and once you have found something that does work for you that it's not just the methodology methodology itself but what you can realistically do with your time there's some things that people do that I couldn't do just because of the time commitment that it would take. It just doesn't work for me. So we have to try something else. Once you find that, whatever that is, just stick with it. 
and don't be in a huge hurry to try new things. <laughs> like, in, normally in life, I'd be like, try new things. But if you have a lot of money bound up in your tank, just know that like your attempts at improving things could go tragically wrong in a hurry. So sometimes it is better to like, if you wanted to, to, to experiment, experiment with a new tank altogether. Don't experiment with the, the, the show tank that is up and running and working really well for you. Might have bad results. 137. Okay. How many pounds of salt do you use in a week? Three hundred, maybe something in that that ballpark. Three hundred pounds. I want to see a good video on aquaforest. What to use and how to use it. Well, I'll tell you what. Save that thought because um, Will has done a lot of research on it. He's currently using it. He's currently happy with it. When he comes on to the next live show, um, you guys can ask him all to your, to your heart's content because he knows a lot about it. Really bright dude. And, and we, we can look, take a look at his tank. I'll, I'll shoot some video of his tank. We'll play it in the background. We can talk about it. So save all your aquaforesty type questions for him. Um, yeah, because I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> love to get your corals here in Italy oh thanks yeah unfortunately we don't do like the international thing but uh, I'd love to be able to, to, to send stuff to, to Europe I mean I know there's so many folks um, overseas that, that are kind of clamoring for these things but it's it's difficult to send these things like just with CITES and whatnot I mean like it's it's always going to be messed up sending your product when your product is covered by like endangered species legislation and international treaties. It's like, that's going to be tough. You're not just selling widgets. You're selling stuff that's on protected lists. Do you have any tips on low phosphate pellet foods or top marine pellet foods? Um, no. Typically, we don't use a lot of pellet. Um, does, do you know, uh, Ben, if Hikari makes marine anything? If, if I was to bet on anybody doing it right, I would say Hikari first and foremost. It's the stuff that I've heard about Hikari in the past, as just as a company and their methodology, it's bonkers. Like, it's bonkers to the point where, like, they're measuring, uh, like, the poop coming out of fish to make sure that the food that they were feeding made it into the animal sort of thing. Like they, they, they go to extreme lengths to develop the best foods. Any tips for upgrading tanks? I have all my rock from one tank and have the new rock that's been curing for a month. I like bigger, bigger equals better. <laughs> I've never regretted getting a bigger tank, I guess. I haven't had that, that happen. Dan, you take Bitcoin? No, but I might, I should. I wonder if uh, if uh, our so we're we're in the really early stages of a website upgrade, revamping it. Oops. Um, so what what number are we on? Okay. Um, we're in the early process or, or in the early stages of a new website, and I'm wondering if the new website will take Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, it's like I should I should take that, and there's there's another thing. I don't know. I guess it's. I guess it's. It's still Bitcoin. I have a Bitcoin wallet out there. I just don't know what it is anymore. It probably has like a teeny tiny fraction of a penny in it.
it's weird how like certain certain uh, zoas are like way out in the open, and the other ones are like, eh, I'm tiny today. Yeah, I need to do some some research, like practically when it comes to like doing business in Bitcoin, because I remember it was like super duper shady at one point. Like you had to like show up in some public place with like an envelope full of cash and stuff. It was weird, like really weird to like buy Bitcoin and to use it. So yeah, I don't know where it's at right now. But I like the idea of cryptocurrency. I don't know if Bitcoin is, is necessarily the answer, but what do I know? I sell coral for a living. Go ahead and ignore that snail in the front. Oh, actually just focus on the snail real quick. So uh, we, we have a snail pack coming up later. So one of these guys. Well, it's not one. It's like 25 of them. It's an Astrea. Um, it's like, I don't know. It's, like, it's one of the last two items. It's going to be a, a snail pack. I think it's like $20 or something like that. So anyway, OK, back to the corals. Oh, this dude, Bay Area Reeves. Hey, Than, do you have any of the championship warrior Zoas? No. I'm so, I'm so, I'm, it's, it's not so much that I'm bitter about that, because I think that the Warriors are just a better team, but it's like, still don't like them. <laughs> don't like the Warriors, don't like Steph Curry. Ship to Canada, plucks. I can't. It's like for everyone that wants me to ship overseas, I think it would be literally cheaper for you to hire somebody to come over here, shop, and somehow get it back to your country. Like for me to for me to do it, it's going to be ridiculously expensive. And I mean, like, get somebody to do it legally for you. I mean, just, it's tough. Yes, congratulations on another championship. I can't be too mad. I mean, it's like, that's, that's a, it's probably the, the, the best basketball team I've ever seen assembled. I just happen to hate Steph Curry a lot. <clears throat> I'll send you a shirt for the next live stream. Oh, that's great. These are the blue steels, I believe. This is one. This is one fifty. Okay. Oh, sorry. These are Wow Pallies. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion, guys. This is one fifty. Yeah, yeah. At least they didn't get swept. They should probably have won Game Three. They kind of choked down the stretch of that one. Um. But I mean, it was just a matter of time. Cause like the thing is, is like the, the the Cavaliers are incapable of playing really good championship level defense, and like you can't outscore the Warriors. You're not gonna do that's gonna go poorly for you. And it did go poorly. But at the same time, it's like what other option did the Cavaliers have? Like, well, we can't guard anybody. There's like there's there's one potentially really good defender on the team, LeBron James. And he puts forth zero effort on defense in, in the finals. Like, did not try. And when he doesn't try and everybody else that's kind of incapable of playing defense doesn't play good defense either, it's like, okay, now you have to outscore the Golden State Warriors. And in one game, you did. You had 86 points at the half. That is not replicable to have an all-time great offensive performance in a seven game series thanks for playing so anyway love my calves glad they made it to the finals 
but whatevs. <clears throat> one fifty one. That sounds like the hurt. Will you ever carry fathead dendros or sun corals? Um. So Ben really wants to, right? He really wants to. I just know that the way that we do maintenance and stuff like that here, a lot of these things are not going to get the proper TLC needed for them to do well. Um, it's, it's really tough to keep them as fed as they need to be. Just saying. So maybe, but it might be tough. No comment on the Purigen. Never used it. I don't even know what it is, to be perfectly honest. I'm guessing it's, is it like a, like a, a chemical filtration resin of some sort? Um, I have not used it. Okay. Okay, so this, these are the green stylos I was telling you about. Okay, you need to back it up a little bit, if you can. It's a little, little tight. Oh uh, yeah, so it's, it's where the, the slider is located. It's a little tight fit back there. But our neon green stylos, usually, if you look on our site right now for neon green stylo, okay, it is bushy and bright, bright green. For whatever reason, this happened in like the last three days, something made these guys very angry. So, they're not supposed to look like this. And that's a snail in the front. So these are lettuce corals? Pachycerus? Not 100% sure on these. What do you use for SPS food? Um, SPS coral food. Um, we just we make our own, and it seems like a lot of the SPS seem to like rotifers. We use frozen rotifers. Okay. Hey, Than, why didn't you go to Reef of Palooza? I usually don't make it to shows. Period. End of story. So we don't really go to any of even the local ones, like here in Ohio. Um, we used to, but we really have cut down on the travel a lot. So. This is like a total personal thing because I know a lot a lot of stores go to to these uh, bigger events. But if if I can take time to do that it to, and to travel, I usually try to leave the country if at all possible because I only have so many available days that I can do stuff like that. So I will be at Macna, and that's largely because. My friends have a place there, and we try to go down there for a little extended weekend once a year anyway. And it happened to be, Magna happened to be New Orleans. We were going to go anyway. I just suggested that we go during that particular weekend. And that's pretty much the only reason I'm going to even be able to make it to Magna. Later on in this year, I've got trips coming up to... Mexico and Japan so like all of the time that I'm able to take off I usually just like get the heck out of here so unfortunately that that completely eats up my my travel itinerary for things like Reef of Palooza or or any show like I've, I've never been to Max I went to two Macnas ever so yeah I don't, I don't travel or if I do travel I'm way the heck out there One fifty nine. Guys, please let us know the scientific names of the corals, not only the common names, so you have the chance to find it overseas. Okay. It makes sense for some more than others. Uh, so this is like a Pasilopora Buracosa. One sixty.
Do you carry any Fruit Loop Zellas? You know, we kind of don't. So we had some, but they were not quite right. They were, they were similar, more similar to like Toucans or Emeralds on Fire, whatever, whichever one you want to call that. But true Fruit Loops are very hard to find because when they come in, I think they, they come in from Indo, they are very fragile. I mean, you buy rock, 90% of it will die. The remaining bit might be dying later on you, but it's they're super fragile. So the, really the only ones that do well are the ones that have been propagated here forever. And it takes a lot of discipline to buy those and propagate them out. Because what typically happens is um well for us we'll just sell them like they're, they're, the the demand is so high for them that people just swoop in and just take them all yeah it's like oh that's great it's like don't don't we have any more no we have like a couple polyps and then a fish will come and eat the two <laughs> and then it's so great now you're back to hunting them down 163 some small small bits of some forest green acro Another small piece. I need to do like a an acro or just like an SPS frag pack. Sometimes people, you know, they, they kind of have an idea of just some SPS to try, they just want to, to pick it up in bulk to save a little bit of money. Some green plating Montipora. John Crowell is Crewell. Is there an easier acro to try out, or are they pretty much the same with care? You know, they're not, but I think a big key is how long they've been in captivity because things that are fresh out of the ocean are a lot less hardy. So you kind of have to be careful of that. It's really tempting to, to buy stuff that's like this recently imported stuff. And so that's kind of the trade off. The recently imported stuff, you might get a, a colony for cheaper than you might get for an aquacultured frag. And that colony may do great for you. And, and, and good job, you got a big piece, saved a bunch of money. But then you also run the risk of, you know, a lot of that risk is bound up in the fact that it just did come from the ocean. And it does not, um, it does not translate back to your home aquarium at all. And... I mean that that's kind of like a choice that every you know hobbyist has to do for themselves. Like, if if I could, I would buy everything here from aquacultured sources, just so I know that they've been in home aquariums because that has a, a huge impact on their survival chances. But uh, you know, there's also something to be said for not everything can be propagated. Um, certain things. Uh, simply have to come from the ocean and then and you can't wait you know six weeks for you know your your importer to have it in their systems it, it'll it'll sell in two hours so you need to you know if you want it you need to buy it now sort of thing and it's like great if it dies then that's that's no good but yeah it's 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 a toughie um but yeah go, going back to your original question Try to find some acros that, that have been in captivity a while. You'll have better better luck. Rico's Reef. What number are you going up to? Uh, 250 something. Okay. Um, which number are you going to end up at? 170? Okay. I'm going to run to use the bathroom with Faso. We'll be right back.
And we're back. It's a little dark, Ben. It's like gorgeous out and at the same time it looks like it's gonna rain. These are some smaller Blastomusa Merletis. We need to propagate these things more, speaking of stuff that is good to propagate. How fast or rather how hard is it to set up a frag tank? Everything in my display tank is overgrowing. It is time to frag. Any suggestions? You can go a lot of different directions when it comes to a frag tank. Um, I just try to just get some inspiration from some other people's setups. Um, but it's not difficult to, to set one up, especially if you have it all plumbed into the same system. Greg Bishop, Leptastria. I don't know if we have Leptastria here on this live sale. It looks like we do. I just, someone said yes. <clears throat> How hot is it out there? It was blazing hot all last week and my electricity bill suffered quite substantially from that. But now it's actually kind of chilly. Like. Which is crazy. It's probably, um, I don't know, like 70 out right now. <clears throat> These are some very tiny purple sea fans. And all of our sea fans are photosynthetic, I think. These are all Caribbean. Where is Reef of Palooza right now? Is, is this the New York one or the Orlando one? It's been years since I've been in Orlando, um, but I've only been to New York once and I think I was like six years old or something. I was very young. Dan, do you sell black egg crate? No, I do not. Seventy-seven. <clears throat> no, like last, like last week, and even just y up up till pretty much yesterday, it was very uncomfortably hot. Yeah, for this past month, though, my electricity bill doubled because of my air conditioning in my house. <clears throat> Yeah, New York. Okay. So when I think of New York, and I don't know what why I think of this, my the first thing that pops into my head is it must be a nightmare to park. I don't know, like of all the things to to worry about, that's like the thing that the thing that pops into my head, like number one is like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine taking tanks and stuff like there and setting up. So for all you guys that are doing that, all you stores. Good on you, because that is a whole bag of stress that I want no part of. That, like taking in a huge display in a car or a truck, parking said car or truck, and setting up a show in New York. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's super easy. It's, like I said, it's been a long time. Uh, yes, Chris, that was a scolemia. Technically, he's in New Jersey in the Meadowlands. 
so the new the Meadowlands is like isn't isn't that one like the Jets play or the Jets used to play the football team? Am I thinking of that right? So these are some daisy polyps. I think they're like, the, so I think they are green star polyps, except they're not green. They're like, it's like basically a pink star polyp. Cause I think daisy polyps might be slightly different than this, but you get the picture. Jets and Giants. It's funny that both, both the New York football teams play in New Jersey. So this thing here might not look like a lot. Trust me when I say it's amazing. It's like, it looks like it's camouflage and it's a plating Montipora that grows the plates like a cup pointed up. So this is just a small frag of it, unfortunately. Welcome Ian Moss. From South Africa. Okay, so uh, for the folks that missed the, my earlier story about these Ganyabora, they were frags. So I sold a frag of this to Will. He grew it to a big old colony, fragged it into two, grew both of those into big old colonies, and then traded one of those colonies back to us for some other LPS. And so we fragged up that one colony, and it's already healed up, and we've got a bunch of frags out of it again. So essentially this and this guy here, same colony, a um, little bright, uh, but essentially this is an aquacultured piece going on two, three years now. So it's done very, very well. One eighty-five. So, w what's crazy is like we think of big cities in the U.S. and when you compare it to big cities overseas, they're like laughably small in comparison. Like, so Cleveland, Ohio, right, is one of the biggest cities in Ohio. It has like three hundred thousand people or something, and it's like a big city here. Um, there's no city in there's no city in ohio that has a million people i don't think i think columbus is like the biggest and i think they're still under a million and anyway it's like that's very very small like tokyo is 12 million people and there's like five cities in china that are probably bigger than 12 million people and it's, it's so i'm thinking about the you know this little parking debate that's going on that's where like pretty much mass transit is the only transit like there's no there's no parking problems because there's no cars for you it's that it's out of the question so everybody has bullet trains and maglav trains and stuff like that 188 will be coming up in a bit greetings from korea do you need to feed lps corals if you don't, will it perish? Most corals don't absolutely need to be fed. Um, some of them will benefit from it greatly, though. Um, it, unless it's non-photosynthetic, non-photosynthetic stuff needs to be fed and needs, needs to be fed quite a bit. But for the ones that are photosynthetic, um, feeding is kind of optional. And feeding is also like not always a great thing because certain corals if you overfeed them some of the food might rot before they they're able to, to spit it up and they might get like sick from that or um, if you have like certain types of shrimp and stuff like that they eventually get hungry and go into the corals and grab the food out of it and, and damage the coral so there's a little bit of good and bad mostly good though Better color, better growth, just like a um, super figus figaccioni. I don't know. How to, I don't know. Have a know how to say anything with an Italian inflection. <laughs> so sorry. Because uh, the the C's are like the 
like 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 Versace, right? This is not like Versace. <laughs> yeah, and and all the uh, and all the Italian viewers just bounced. How do I get rid of calcium buildup on rocks? It looks like two berms or it's not. I'm not sure. I don't think I've seen that. Aquatic angler. What's the most expensive coral you own? <clears throat> What's the most expensive coral I own? We got an endophilia that's probably going to be four figures if it ever goes up for sale here. Very nice. Speaking of very nice, that's a ridiculously nice Redactus. That's probably already sold now that I just look at it with this light. Besides Acanthophilia, what other corals are edible? Are Acanthophilia edible? Hmm. All right. See you, Ernie Wallace. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Yeah, all of these redactuses are looking really good. I certainly would not want to eat a coral. But then again, so has anybody ever had escargot? It's like it's the uh, you know, snails. Um, so I have, and they're kind of delicious. It's kind of like a cross between a mushroom and a mussel or something like that in flavor, I think. And the, but you know, if you ever pull a dead snail out of your tank, that's the last thing in the world I would ever want to have anything to do with. So. Who knows? Maybe some corals do taste good. I can't imagine because I smell coral. That doesn't look like doesn't smell like something I want to eat. What state is Tidal Gardens in? Ohio. And we're back to some zoas. It looks like. <clears throat> People eat sea squirts. Yeah, Sherelle. It's like that that is uh that does show up on uh some items. Like sea cucumber shows up occasionally. Um all types of snails do. I guess like conch is really good. And I guess that's a Caribbean thing. I've I've never had that, but like those giant conch shells. I guess like the massive snail that's that's in there tastes pretty good. When you when you visit Japan, try sea snail sashimi. I may have had it. I had a lot of weird stuff when I was there. Like a lot of stuff that so I've had a lot of sushi in my days, okay? So it's not like just like, I only eat steak and potato. No, I'm not that guy. I am very food adventurous. You know, when I was in Japan, like, I've had just about every kind of sushi imaginable in the States. And the stuff in Japan is different. It's a lot of stuff in Japan. It's like, I have no idea what that is. Like, no clue. You know, it, so, and a lot of it was like weird mollusks and stuff like that. We went to a lot of like really fancy sushi places and and some not so fancy ones and yeah 
some things are like no clue what this could even possibly be and so uh, for example like scallops I always kind of joke about how like most scallops that, that, that you get served to you aren't really scallop it's usually um, a type of a fish or something like that that's being sold to you as a scallop because it's close enough in texture uh, because like if you have like a, a scallop that's like in the size of a hockey puck that thing was probably not ever in a shell you know that's a fish right so I was thinking that, and then I was at a really um, nice uh, sushi place. So if you've ever seen that movie, um, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, um, I went to that restaurant, Suki Yobashi Jiro. And anyway, like the guy serves scallop, and it's the size of a hockey puck. And I'm like, how am I at this like fancy sushi place, and they're serving me this like ridiculous thing, right? Because it's like, it's not even a scallop. And just for fun, like the guy, I, I didn't say a word. The guy probably doesn't even speak English, but he brings up this shell that is bigger than my head. It's like this saucer place size shell. And he like pulls the, the, the thing up to this giant plate of a shell. I'm like, that is the, it's, I mean, it's like this big, the, the shell of this particular scallop. So yeah, again, a lot of weird stuff. <clears throat> what are the spider web looking strands I see on some of the corals? It could be a number of things. Um, it comes down to um, cyanobacteria, and it could be zooxanthellae being expelled. So summertime, a lot of like a lot of micro things start to pr proliferate. So that's why you're seeing a lot of bubbles on stuff. That's from them, you know, photosynthesizing, and those are like oxygen bubbles. Um, so it's a mixture of like like a lot of film algaes and stuff like that tend to grow quite a lot in the greenhouse, and it kind of coats the corals. They they shed it off, but that's kind of what you're looking at. And what causes bleaching? Yeah, too much light. Um, anything that's gonna that's gonna kill those anthelli can do it. So, for example, uh, certain certain chemicals like zinc and stuff like that are toxic. So, any number of things could. Some nuclear green pallies. We usually don't grow these things fast enough to ever really sell them in any volume. It's kind of a shame because I do like them. They're very bright. Yeah, copper is bad for corals. And certain things have like a little bit of copper, like you wouldn't expect it to, but um, if you look at the ingredients list for a lot of different um, two-part things, some of them actually have a listed listed on there. Copper is in there. Coming down the home stretch here. <clears throat> Actually making pretty decent time. Looks like we're going to be getting out of here well before 5 o'clock. That's the hope anyways. Actually, we might not. I don't know. We'll see. So it's 4.20 p.m. right now. Um, and we have a little less than 50 corals to go. So we might, not, we might be getting into that 5 o'clock area. Hills have ice chalice. Way earlier in the live show, we went through a series of chalices, and that particular hills have eyes didn't have the bright green eyes, whereas this one does. Oh. 
conch fitters are amazing, but I love my conch so I won't eat them. I've kind of become that way a lot with food. So, unless I'm traveling, I try to um, kind of tone down the meat consumption quite a bit. And all of these Pink Floyd chalices look so weird right now. Hmm. I'm used to them having a... Uh, because because they have a very flat appearance right now. Two eleven. Actually, this is closer to what I would expect. And all this talk of food is making me hungry. Not sure where I'm gonna go eat though. I'm thinking maybe Lebanese or something. I haven't been to the, we have like a, like a local Lebanese restaurant that I'm always at. They're probably sick of seeing me there. But I hadn't been there in a few days, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. And yeah, people were asking you earlier about like whether you can keep chalices close to each other while they fight. It's pretty much, yeah, you do. Uh, once we're done with this live show, we need to make sure to like to, that these are all guys are all like put down flat so that they they don't um, get like roll into one another and things like that because if they do then they just they, they die almost instantly. <clears throat> Mm, that's crazy. I want to get more rainbow chalices in general. There's so many different types and they look so cool. I don't know what it is, but like, so, I mean, I've, I've just been like grabbing a couple of these icebreaker mints and these things make me so hungry. It's not even funny. It just like just empties out my stomach or something. Man, I'm like really, really hungry now. What do you think about starting your tank with tap water and then using a dechlor, like a dechlorinizer? Um, I would not do that. So tap water can be all over the place in terms of quality. So. It depends on like the municipality as to how good that would even be for starting salt water. Um, so chlorine isn't just the only issue with it. So there could be like tons of TDS um, in, the, in any particular water supply. Like where my parents live, it's about 200-ish. And back then I did use straight tap water um, to make my salt water. Here we're on a well and the TDS is like 900. And if you try to make salt water with that type of water, when you're starting off with TDS that high, what happens is there's so much reactivity that the entire the, the next day everything was coated white because all of the calcium came out of solution. Like that that's how um, how basic the the water was. So you can do it depending on how good your starting water is. Would I do it? Heck no. At the very minimum, I would do RO water. Also, it's like, what is your realistic cost savings on water to not do RO? Like, of all the things that you're spending money on in this hobby, 
that is not the corner that I would choose to cut. So Consent 21, I just ordered 75 gallon of tap water and the tank's looking really good and I'm in Brooklyn. And that can work, it depends on the water supply. But it also depends on the accumulation of heavy metals sometimes. So what might start just fine over time might build up certain things. So like, let's just say you have very, very, very low concentrations of of copper um, initially that won't kill your corals um, however as it builds up because heavy metals don't come out of your your water nearly as easily um, so if you if you're using uh, like using the same water source that that hasn't been filtered you do end up with this buildup and so you can do like algal turf scrubbing and stuff like that but most people don't do stuff like that so what ends up happening is you get this uh, this accumulation of heavy metals and finally it gets to a point where it's toxic and then it's like well what's going on I'm losing all my corals it's because of this this chronic buildup so you kind of have to be careful of that can you frag some Philly radians I don't think so I think you can frag some Philly Wilsoni but not the radians not sure 224. Uh, T. Soro, how come you're not in New Jersey for Reef of Palooza? Um, we went over this earlier, but long story short, I only have a few travel days in my schedule every year, and when those travel days come up, I try to leave the country whenever possible. Uh, going back to calcium buildup, I use tap water. My tap water probably has a lot of calcium. Actually, your tap water doesn't have a lot of calcium. Your salt does, but something in your water is making all of that calcium in the salt in, the, in your salt mix come out of the solution. That's probably what's going on there. I mean, just do like a simple TDS test. If you're getting like 500 or something, it's going to react with everything in your salt when it really should be staying in solution. It's kind of the point of salt water is you want all those ions and everything in solution and bioavailable. But if you have too much going on in, in, in the way of, um, of TDS, it's just all of that stuff is going to start binding up all of like, you know, your magnesium, your calcium or whatever else and just draw, and just draw it right out of the water. Yeah, I gotta be careful with that sometimes. And, and, and again, keep on saying it. Depends on your water. Um, some some places are just fine. It's basically like a fresh spring. Other places, it's like Flint, Flint, Michigan. Not good water. We used to have so many different types of fats of Cephastria, and we're only down to like a couple of different types now. But I'm really looking forward to to revamping our selection of Cephastria. It's one of my it's one of my favorite, you know, weird little corals. Tater tot, how many left? We're going to two fifty something, so about thirty. Somebody earlier was asking about Leptastria, so here you go. We've got some some orange Leptastria. My TDS is around 375. Yeah, it's high. I shoot for a TDS under 10. Um, some people are like, it has to be zero. Under 10 is pretty good. 
Um, and sometimes uh, your efforts to get it below that kind of derail the whole process. So for example, um, the water coming out of my RO system is about at eight, and then I added a DI stage. And the DI is like, you know, it's supposed to take it down to zero. Well, if the DI gets expended, which in my case it did, it will start to leach that sort of back into your water. So I was taking my TDS of nine back up to like 20 something. So wasn't helping, but um, yeah, just make sure that, that you just keep up on the maintenance, I guess. <clears throat> Why is faster melted? Hmm. Yeah, tough to say. Usually for us, it's too much light if they're if they're doing really really poorly. We're finally able to actually get some elegances in. These are one of the things that we can't propagate, unfortunately. <clears throat> so in your Fauna Marin coral video, you discuss the coral used the mucus covering on its body to suck in the food pellet. How exactly does this work? Not really sure, but a lot of corals do that. They're able to to retract like the, their mucus coat and just gobble up everything that got stuck in it. So this is a type of so usually um, I don't mess with symphilia, but this is a symphilia wilsoni. I think it's just one L. Uh, so you put this here. It's a Symphilia wilsoni. Um, usually Symphilia do very, very poorly in my systems and I don't try to go after them. But I guess this variety not, not only is supposed to do well, but you can also propagate it. So we're giving it a go. Okay. 234. And we're finishing it out with a bunch of random stuff. So. Should be good. So we do have some some repeats here and there, but I've when we were looking at our some of our analytics. It's like the average time that people uh, s actually spend watching, it's like 15 minutes of a three hour show. So like people are like coming in and out, in and out, in and out all the time. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to, you know, if somebody had mixed, just, just missed something earlier, um, they have a second chance of, of seeing some of these things that they, they didn't see the first time around. What's your experience with algae using Chato? Uh, so we don't really mess with that too much. And unfortunately we don't have like some great numbers to back up anything. You know, I think that Bulk Reef Supply did a video on, on Chato and I think they might've taken measurements. I didn't watch the video, so I don't really know. I just saw the title. So you might want to check out that video. Um, they might have some good information on that. Because otherwise it's just going to be anecdotal, right? Like the idea is you have algae, it binds up nutrients, it binds up phosphate, nitrate, binds up heavy metals, and then by removing that, you're effectively filtering your tank. Um, how effective is that? How much do you need for the volume of tank that you have? It's all kind of up for debate, um, unless you actually measure it. 
which I've never done. Greg, how many have you sold so far or usually during live sales? I don't know. It's kind of all over the board. It depends on, on season as well. Like the, uh, the summertime live shows tend to uh, be a little slower than like the wintertime ones. Uh, so, and occasionally like some of the ones that I don't think are going to be nearly that good have been the best. Um, like sometimes we have like really, really, really high price stuff and really, really, really low price stuff and their, their performance is like all over the board. Um, if you wanted to see how many we've sold so far, I think you just go to the site to see, you know, what numbers are missing. <laughs> I haven't even looked. Can you propagate fungia? Uh, I've had no luck with it. Uh, some you can, some you can't. Like this one, you really can't. Oh, this one fell, fell flat, but... It's an orange plate. Yeah, certain kinds, like we call them all fungia, but there's there's actually different. Uh, there there's like a different genus for them, and certain ones you certain ones kind of have like a scaled shape. They kind of form like multiple plates, and those can be broken up. But some of them, if you cut them, you're you're basically killing them. What's your experience with green tongue coral? Um, we've, we've got some tongue corals here. They tend to be a little easier to keep than plate corals. And you can, uh, the ones here anyways, you can cut them. Man, I need food badly. Ugh, I'm so hungry. <laughs> so hungry. So this is the last of the sea fans, I believe. These are some, um, again, Caribbean sea fans. We've been propagating this kind forever, seemingly. It's a very fast grower. Oops. Okay. Okay, so next up is going to be 244, and we have a small set of random acros. This one here looks like a millipora. Any torches? Uh, no, we didn't. We we only had a few euphilia in general. Okay, two forty-five. It's another similar one. kind of has that tequila sunrise-ish coloration. So when it comes to Acropora, they can change dramatically depending on both water quality and with lighting. Interesting fluorescence on this one. So it looks pink and it fluoresces green.
This looks like another one kind of similar. Right after this show, I'm totally going to eat a whole pizza by myself. <laughs> I could see that being a reality. Thanks, Greg. I'm glad that you had a good time. That goes for all of you guys. Thanks for joining in. It's still really gorgeous out, so I, I'm I'm enthused about the nice weather. For the because lately it has not been that nice. It's been too sunny. Two fifty, and this is the last acro. Okay, so the last one. Uh, the last couple here is going to be a bubble tip anemone. Go ahead and take a look at these. So we've got a bunch of these guys, and I think there's like uh, at least 20 or so available, question mark. Um, I forget how many there are on the site, but they're, they're $50. And the last, last one are gonna, is the snail pack. which I don't even have a thing for. So like I said, snail pack, 20 bucks. Um, it's 252 is a snail pack. So hopefully you guys like the show. Um, again, I'm gonna say a quick shout out to the, to the Patreon fam. So thanks again, Phil, Mark, Robert, Steve, Ryan, Dave, Nate, Nancy, and Jeff. So. Thanks again for all your support. Uh, check out patreon.com slash if you want to know more about how to become a donor. And all right, guys. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I am out of here. I am so hungry. 